and uh, helped develop the acute and chronic pain program at Maimonides, as well as the residence rotation. Here are my offices in case any of you um, are in need of a pain specialist to refer patients to. These are the phone numbers from my Great Neck, Long Island, and Brooklyn office. And um, I could always share them with you. If you guys are interested, I do um, run these websites that do board review. And you could uh, contact me um, if you are interested. Um, I, I give you guys all a discount if you're, if, you, if you're in need and they provide CME credits. And here are some of my workshops in case you're interested in looking at the calendar. There's a QR code you could just scan in case any of you would like to attend. Uh, I've had some of you guys come as volunteers in the past, so um, I appreciate the help and um, love to work with, you know, the younger physicians. And this is for our newsletter in case you're interested in just being updated. Um, we have a podcast. We put out educational free, free educational content so it can keep you updated. Um, as to all of the activities that we're doing. So the cluneal nerves, um, I was in med school, I learned about these nerves, and then I became an intern, anesthesia resident, pain fellow, created all this educational content, and I still never heard the word cluneal nerve over the last 12 years, the 12 years following my, uh, or 15 years following my, my, my medical school. Until one day I'm doing a peripheral nerve simulator and the rep is like, hey, why don't you try a cluneal nerve? I'm like, let me review that. And basically I realized people have been coming to me for years telling me that they have pain at their PSIS or a little lateral to it. And as my attendings taught me, I was diagnosing this more or less as a trigger point and treating it as either a trigger point, SI joint pain, gluteal bursitis, um, or some other uh, buttock type of pain diagnosis, it's not the cluneal nerve. These patients will often have very typical trigger points, which it's very common. And if you palpate these, these little blue circles on yourself or somewhere near them, you can find some sensitive spots and those most likely will correlate of the, as to the location of the superior cluneal nerve as it's passing over the iliac crest. It, um, it, I mentioned it was also diagnosed as facet pain. It was dismissed as many things. So to make the diagnosis, you're looking for a low back pain involving the iliac crest and buttocks. Symptoms can be aggravated by lumbar movement or posture, trigger points over the posterior iliac crest corresponding to the nerve compression drone zone, and there's numbness or pain radiating in the region of the nerve, mainly at tenels. And then there's symptomatic relief with blockade of the nerve. The, um, the, the, uh, now we talked about all this already. Okay, so here's a little video I created. Um, it's on YouTube, I believe. I'm going to let it play. Superior it cluneal over. nerves originate from the dorsal rami of primarily the upper lumbar spinal nerves. The nerves cross the iliac spine to innervate the skin and subcutaneous tissue over the gluteal region. The nerves extend as far as the greater trochanter, and the area of innervation may overlap anterolaterally and the iliohypogastric and lateral femoral cutaneous nerves. A reliable nerve block technique may have the application in the management of postoperative hip pain surgery as well as other clinical conditions, for example, chronic low back pain. This superior cluneal nerve block will anesthetize the skin posterior to the area innervated by the iliohypogastric and subcostal nerves, improving anesthetic coverage for hip surgery. A diagnosis of Superior cluneal nerve and medial cluneal nerve entrapment may be made by palpation of the iliac crest or long posterior sacroiliac ligament, resulting in marked tenderness and provocation of symptoms and pain relief with local anesthetic injection. The superior cluneal nerve tender point on the posterior iliac crest is approximately 70 millimeters from the midline and 45 millimeters from the posterior superior iliac spine. And the osteocomponent component of this tunnel is a rim iliac crest and the fibrous component is the tough thoracolumbar lumbar fascia. Now that's the medial branch of the superior cluneal nerve. Now I'm just pausing the video for a second because this is a longitudinal approach I took. I made this video when I first started doing these blocks. I pointed at the nerve as being like this hyperlucency over here. I don't know if you can see my mouse moving, but 
the truth is it could be very easily confused with the thoracolumbar fascia, which is running parallel in the same plane. So in order to isolate the nerve better, I usually go cross sectional view of the nerve, which is what we'll see soon. Oh. Superior cranial nerves or Now, this is a patient who originally had a sacroiliac joint injection as well as gluteal trigger points, gluteal bursa injection without any long-term relief. And on exam, she did a positive to nails near the iliac crest, right where my needle is and where I'm working. And what I did first is a longitudinal view and I identified and anesthetized a medial branch of the cluneal nerve, and now I'm doing a cross-sectional view with a transverse approach. And the nerve is quite small and difficult to identify. And the best way to identify a positive nerve lock is to have the patient report response with only one or two mLs of lidocaine 2%. This patient did very well and is going to go on to peripheral neuromodulation. This patient had a laminectomy and axial pain to the right side, radiating to the buttock and hip. He was unwilling to come for fluoroscopic facet or medial branch nerve lock. And in the office, I performed a superior cranial nerve lock at the higher lumbar regions where his trigger points were that were radiating down to the lower back, buttocks, and side of his hip. Upon Going towards the more superficial hyperlucency, the patient reported concordant pain. Upon redirecting the needle and depositing 1 ml of lidocaine 2% at the deeper trigger point or hyperlucent spot, the patient reported pain that correlated exactly with the superior cluneal nerve distribution. It radiated from this region down to his buttock and side of his hip. Patient reported immediate pain relief and is to be followed up in the office for possible repeat injection or maybe peripheral neuromodulation in the future. So this is a, another video, short video, where you see me tracing a spinal cord stimulator lead uh, down towards the actual stimulator. Um, and that's the hyperlucency with the shadow behind it. And I'm running a... Um, uh, 25 gauge um, um, needle underneath um, the wire to get to the um, to the nerve, which is a low hyperlucency here. Now there's a lot of white specks here that could be the nerve, and honestly, it's difficult to tell. And I always question myself. Um, the best way, I, the best experience I have where I could say that I'm really on the nerve is I've done peripheral neuromodulation. You stimulate the nerve, and the patient will get paresthesias with with, with um, with the with the nerve stimulator. Here's another. He's had the medial, middle, yeah. and low branch blocked with excellent relief short term, and now he's here for a cryo ablation for the long term treatment of his pain. So, Mike, I'm going to look for the first nerve first, which is over here, and we're going to work our way lateral. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, on the ultrasound, you can see the posterior superior iliac spine coming into view, and just lateral to that. The hyperlucent structure is the superior cluneal nerve, medial branch. Spray with some vapor coolant spray and anesthetize the skin. Go pinch, Michael. That's from Michael. Right there. The needle's right here. It's a little hard to see. Even though it's a very large needle, it's not the most echo lucid needle. I don't know if you guys have any experience with that device, but I'm not going to name it because of um, 
I'm not sure if you guys are getting, uh, yeah, you guys are getting CME for this, but basically that device does a nice uh, cryo lesion. It disrupts the myelin sheath. So it takes three months for the myelin to grow back. So basically you get um, um, pain relief without actually physically damaging the axon. You're just damaging the myelin, which grows back. So you get three months of pain relief. Unfortunately, that needle is not covered by insurance and can be quite costly. So anyway, moving on to the middle, uh, I should say middle clunial, not medial clunial. The middle clunial nerves, they exit from the sacral forama S1 through S4. Most commonly uh, affected level is S2. It passes through the PSIS, I'm sorry, for the posterior longitudinal SI joint ligament that's from the PSIS to the sacrum. This is the ligament under ultrasound. And basically with pregnancy or other conditions, the nerve can be impinged as it passes more laterally and cause pain almost to the SI joint or buttock region can, can really mimic a lot of different syndromes here. Um, it, it's one of those um, nerves that are very difficult to see. I, I, I made a notation here. I think the nerve is, this is the S1 foramen. and I'm scanning longitude, that's L5 S1 facet. I think the nerve is somewhere over here. You scan a little lateral to the, to the foramen and I think it's, it's, it's just a, a speck more or less outside the foramen. Um, similar diagnostic criteria, except for the location is different. It's exacerbated by postural changes. The trigger point instead on, on the middle is 35 millimeters caudate to the PSIS and lateral to the edge of the iliac zone, carlane to the nerve compression zone. Numbness and radiating pain in, the, in that region when you press on it, and it can be relieved with a nerve block. The inferior cranial nerves are basically the posterior cutaneous uh, femoral nerves, which are I've tried blocking it a couple times. They're very small. I couldn't really appreciate a good image, so I, I'm not really going to show you much on that. It's not as commonly uh, a procedure that most of us do. Um, and I have some time to discuss other spine things. Um, I, you guys are physiatrists. I mean, stellate ganglion blocks I can review. Um, do you guys have any interest in that, or should I just move on to the classic spine stuff? Yeah, you could go. You could go over those if you if you'd like. Okay, so stellate ganglion is a sympathetic block. It's the uppermost uh, sympathetic. We're using this for complex regional pain syndrome, neuropathic pain of the upper extremity. Um, if you have an ant accidental intraarticular injection and you want vasodilation, this can help. We've used it for facial pain, atypical facial pain. Um, Zoster of the face. Uh, in the literature, it says you could do pulmon you could treat a pulmonary embolism with this, but I don't know anyone doing this for pulmonary embolism. I think the, 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 the they're thinking maybe you get some pulmonary vasodilation. Um, we, um, the, the sympathetic nerves, they're, um, they, they, they come from the C7, 8, T1, and occasionally 5, 6. It's a gray ram eye communicating nerves. Also, T2, T2 and 3 have similar uh, gray ram eye communicating nerves that innervate the distal upper extremity and may not pass through the ganglion, so they can actually be missed when you do the block. So, just um, the ultrasound is the, probably the safest way to do this. I used to do this under x-ray. In training, I witnessed this done blind, which you can imagine they took the carotid with their fingers and the anesthesiologist felt, felt, felt the area between the carotid and the trachea. And they went in until they felt bone, walked back up a little bit, aspirated and inject. But you have to understand, you have a lot going on in the neck, carotid artery, trachea, esophagus. Okay, you don't want to, um, to traumatize any of these tissues. Look at, look at what can go wrong. It's a very large list because there are so many vital structures in the neck. You could get a vagal nerve block, brachial plexus injection, pneumothorax, chylothorax, hemothorax, esophageal perforation, inadvertent um, other nerves being blocked, like the recurrent laryngeal causing ho hoarseness, phrenic nerve. That's why you don't want to do this bilateral, because if you do phrenic nerve paralysis bilateral, they stop breathing. You have to intubate the patient. Horner syndrome, uh, here's one of my older patients from years ago. We captured an image of her right after the block. You can see ptosis, meiosis, and then the anhydrosis, um, which you get when, with an effective block. Also keep in mind, you have the superior thyroid artery. So if you're going transthyroid like I often do, you got to make sure that you're not going to go through the artery. Okay, here's uh, an image of the patient swallowing, and you see the esophagus right over here, right there. You see that? So you don't want to do this shot 
you know, you go under x-ray and then you get an esophagram, that's a little too late. That's why I like ultrasound because you can see all these vital structures and avoid them. This is a cartoon of what it looks like to come from the lateral approach. You need to watch out for the brachial plexus. If you come medially, you uh, go through the thyroid and hopefully you're in the clear. The picture of the lateral approach, here's your thyroid. The trachea is off over here to the center. Steroclayomastoid has that long tapered appearance, which is very classic. Here's another image. You're injecting on top of the longus coli muscle and right where the ganglion is posterior to the carotid artery. Okay, so now here's the medial approach just coming from the center. You have to be very careful not to hit the, the artery. It's a little uh, movie of a steli ganglion block. I'm coming with two different machines in this movie. It's two separate clips of different patients. There's a superior thyroid artery. And I'm coming in, it looks like I'm going into the trachea, but I'm actually not. I'm going lateral to it, and my needle goes right behind the carotid artery. And I'm injecting some local anesthetic. Sometimes I add steroid, but usually you don't need to. Just local anesthetic is, is enough. And we've been doing this for PTSD. And most recently, I started doing these for post-COVID anosmia and phantosmia. It's been working. Not permanent cures, but it's, been help it's definitely been helping. So just, you know, be careful. Don't do this on patients who are anticoagulated. Don't do it bilateral. P people who had recent cardiac issues, you don't want to do it for. You have to be very careful. Uh, glaucoma could be a relative contraindication because it may uh, increase the intraocular pressure. And uh, caution with AB block. We mentioned the complications before. So moving on, um, the SI joint. Basically, you're looking for two bones overlapping, the iliac bone and the sacrum. The iliac bone is up here, the sacrum is down here. This joint space is just a black space behind the hidden behind the bone. It's behind the bone shadow, so you typically cannot see it. Here's a facet joint injection. It's the needle coming in. This is a low-frequency ultrasound probe, so it's curved. You can get deeper structures. And the medial branch is a nerve that innervates the facet joint, and you can't see it well, but the location, the vicinity is over here. And here's an image of the L5S1 facet joint. You're not seeing the joint space opening, but this is the bone and the capsules around it. So you could theoretically put a needle right here and give the patient good relief. Now, the payers are not paying for us to do this shot, so most people are not doing it. Just not a covered procedure. The dorsal ramus is the nerve there. You can't very see very well, but this is the location of it. So if you want to do the nerve block, that's where you would do it. The cross section of the vertebral body looks like a chair. The spinous process is the back of the chair. The lamina is where you put your tush. The facet joint is the angle where your knees would, would rest over, and then your feet would go back to down, sit on the transverse process. Here's an opening of the facet joint under ultrasound. Here's an image of it. This image looks better than the last one because this is of a nine-year-old. Kids, the spine is a lot easier to see. Transverse process, medial branch target zone, which this white somewhere over here could be medial branch, joint and capsule. So cervical anatomy, we just, going over um, the basics here. This is the cross-section of vertebral body. And what's really important to note when we're thinking ultrasound are the bones. So we have the, the spinous process, the uh, lamina, it's a bifid spinous process, the posterior tubercle, anterior tubercle, the nerve comes out here, the vertebral artery, which we should be cognizant of. Now, lo locating the brachial plexus, which is really how you could find and trace back the, the nerves of the neck. Here's the thyroid once again. Here's the carotid artery. I do a lot of extra foraminal nerve root injections because I don't want to do epidurals. I don't think they're necessary for everyone with cervical radic. 
So I see the brachial plexus is the interscaling brachial plexus that us anesthesiologists anesthetize all the time for shoulder surgeries. I'm tracing the nerves back as they disappear to the frame in C5, C6, C7. Usually, this is C6. Okay, it's the black nerve. And they change colors, they become lighter as you go more distal, but it's going back into the foraminal space, disappearing into the neck. Okay, here's my needle. Uh, here's a better picture. Here's the vertebral artery, no fly zone, right? That's the articular pillar. That's not really the posterior tubercle. Posterior tubercle, you don't see as well here. You need to fix that. Here's the vertebral the artery again. Artery. And the sternocleidomastoid muscle at the top. You see the anterior and posterior tubercles. And the C6 nerve can be followed down as you go towards the interscaling brachial plexus and coming back up to the posterior towards the foramen as it enters the foramen. And back down again. C5 is the most superficial nerve root of the brachial plexus in the interscaling region. Here we have the carotid and vertebral artery as it transitions posteriorly towards the foramen. Now it's hypoechoic, just like the nerve, and it's running posterior. The C6 nerve is also hypoechoic and is more lateral at this point. Injecting in the cervical region can be easy, but challenging at times. It's important to understand where the blood vessel lies, as well as the neuroanatomy and other vital structures in the neck. My recommendation is to use dexamethasone or a non-particulate steroid to avoid vascular embolization or vasospasm from intraarterial injection, as well as to hydrodissect a little bit if possible and safe. Watch your medication spread. Sometimes the needle does not need to be directly next to the nerve root or the nerve. Sometimes you can be a few millimeters away and the medication will diffuse onto the nerve and therefore you will decrease the risk of the needle contacting the nerve or causing more discomfort for the patient. There are times when my needle is close to the articular pillar and I see the medication diffuse towards the foramen or towards the nerve and usually that's adequate. So. I hope to see you at the Tampa course. I hope to see you online. You don't need that. Cervical facets, they look like um, shingles on a house. Okay, you see, it's just like a shingled appearance on the ultrasound. I used to do a lot of these, but um, I find it easier and more effective than medial branch nerve blocks. Um, and um, so I do it that way. These are the medial branch nerves. They come off the exiting nerve root and they loop around to get the facet joints. They run on the articular pillars, these rhomboids right here. So when you're looking at it with a lateral view, your target is right where my red dot is for the medial branch nerves. Going on the ultrasound, you can see a hyperlucency. Um, this is coming from lateral, but it's actually very obvious when you're doing an oblique ultrasound image and you're getting the nerve on the bone. Sometimes the problem is you have to go out of plane. It's a little challenging to get to get the needle over there. Uh, Caudal epidurals, um, Medicare will not pay for them unless the patient's pregnant or there is an issue with um, anticoagulation. Um, we use it for lumbar radiculopathy. Uh, they're very good uh, to avoid um, lumbar punctures. Um, Post-operative patients, people with failed back and you want to avoid hardware. Here's a little video on it. And by the way, most of my videos are on YouTube. So if you just go to YouTube and type in pain exam, you'll see my channel or maybe put my name in and, and you'll get a whole bunch of videos. There's a sacral cornu, those those two hyperlucent structures. And this the sacrum's here, which is a cross-section view over the um over the uh region of the um bone. Now I'm turning 90 degrees. And that's the plane I'm scanning in parasagittal to see the cornu. And then we go sagittal to centrally to see the actual region of the, of the epidural space. My needle's coming in, I'm anesthetizing a tissue. There's a sacral coccygeal ligament. And the Try to get in there. I actually wind up hitting the bone on top and then I redirect and I get in there.
We're using a higher volume when we go here than a regular epidural to get the needle up to the spot of their issues, L4 or 5. There's a lot more anterior spread with the caudal, so it's very good for many different conditions. Um, it helps a lot with spinal stenosis, um, radiculopathy, of course. Sympathetic nerves that come off the spine, they're running anterior lateral body, superior hypogastrous. It's very hard to do with an ultrasound. Ganglion in part is doable, a little challenging. Here's an image of the sacral frame, which can appear like this, or it could just appear as a bone gap. Um, sometimes there's some tissue around or I'm just skimming the edge with the ultrasound probe. That's why it looks like that. But usually when you do a cross section, if you turn the probe 90 degrees, you're looking at the same level as the PSIS. And here's uh, the region of the ganglion impar, which I have a video on YouTube. It's not here. Um, that's the whole lecture, actually. I just finished on time, it looks like. Um, do you guys have any questions? Hey, Dr. Rosenblum. Uh, this is Dr. Kaner. Uh, I'm, I'm the one of the graduates of 2020. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I have a quick question. Uh, what sure. was the, I mean, I got my, I got the code from the billing, but what is the exact coding CPT for colonial nerve block? 64450, other peripheral nerve block. And you can add the ultrasound code, which is 76942. Uh, let me write it down. 64440. 64450. And with the colonial nerves, I mean, I did two of them today. I mean, I had one lady, she's failed back. She came in. The patient had pain at the iliac crest rating to the buttock, and um, it didn't look facetogenic. I'm sure there was a facetogenic component, but I didn't mention in the lecture, there is communication between the, the medial branch nerves and, and the colonial nerves in many cases when they dissect out the cadaver. So it's just something to consider. Yeah, so for the resident's sake, I mean, I get a lot of lower back patients. I do rural medicine inpatient, outpatient rehab, and I was doing a lot of, you know, lower deep, uh, deep muscle blocks, trigger points, things like that, and SI. But then I realized that actually wherever I inject around that PSIS region, they just come so happy. And every six That's months, right. four months, they just like, they come with a walker, like bending, walking very slow. And then they leave, they literally extending, smiling. And then I have a friend actually who's doing pain, pain fellowship right now. He's a graduate from 2021 from our program. We asked this. To one of the mentors in the field and they told us about colonial nerves and i actually watched your videos and since <laughs> then i've been doing it like at least twice a week and it's amazing how how much they find benefit and it's crazy, right? yes absolutely i think the awareness of this nerve should be relay on the medicine and we, i mean the residency programs definitely more because i did a lot of ultrasound workshops i was involved in spinal cord injury fellowship whatnot i did not hurt this nerve until I was an attending and just trying to figure out what's going on. So thank you very much for helping the residents for uh, you know such a thing. Yeah, you're right. It's it's completely underappreciated, and a lot of people don't know about it. But there you do. <laughs> and if you look for it, you, I guarantee you'll find it. It could coexist with a lot of things. In fact, I've had people I did the nerve lock on, and they said, "Oh wow, my leg pain got better. It mimics sciatica." So when you're hitting a dead end and you're not getting relief with the typical things, think about it and try it. So, uh, Dr. Rosenblum, when you're yep. approaching somebody with that kind of back pain or, or gluteal pain, um, are you only going to the cluneals once you exhaust everything else? Or are you looking at it as first line now for some of these like uh, buttocks pain and back pain and stuff? Uh, you know, it's not that it's, it's it's very simple. They come in if they have tunnels overlying the region most lateral to the PSIS. That's where the, the medial branches. Um, you know, I encourage you all to feel it on yourself. Just feel your PSIS and run your finger laterally and you'll feel like a little sensitive spot. And then if you follow the iliac crest again, you'll feel another sensitive spot midway between the medial and lateral aspect of the, of the crest and that's the middle cluneal nerve. Now, if you scan your, if you touch even more lateral to go closer to the axilla on the iliac crest, you'll probably feel another sensitive point and that's another place the nerve can get entrapped. And I've seen all 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 different you know types of patients present with all different um, all three of them. And of course, it might not be three; it could be four. There could be different branches. It's like a tree. It's not like everybody's the same. And I also want to add that that seventy millimeter, like seven centimeter from the midline, so the uh, middle colonial nerve, guys. If you just measure. And touch that spot and put the probe, you will exactly find the nerve. 
I see that seven centimeter is extremely uh, sensitive and uh, useful. Right. And that's a that's a that's a general average. So it could be a little more, it could be a little less, but more or less he's right. So absolutely. Wow. Any more questions? Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thanks for your time. And um, yep, yeah. I, I hope to hear from you guys. Take care. Yeah, thanks. Be well. Bye.